want to live within the sound of a church or chapel bell. But I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 1. And there is so much to church life that happens behind the scenes. It's nice for us to have a book like this in the Bible because in it God opens our eyes to some of the things that happen that might go unnoticed. And really this is a letter from Paul as an apostle, which is a high level of authority and responsibility in the church realm, to a man named Timothy, who also has a great position of responsibility and authority in the church. And because we have this in the Bible, we can see some of the behind-the-scenes things that some of us as just regular churchgoers or visitors would never see. And this morning we see that church is sometimes more than what we would have thought it to be. I don't know what it is that's in our heads when it comes to church and what we think it ought to look like, but oftentimes we find out that it's something quite different, at least in those fellowships that are being run according to God's Word. Paul has left his young protege, Timothy, in Ephesus, which is a city that has a church in it, to deal with problem people in that church. If you look at verse 18, we'll read our text this morning, three short verses. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some, having rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander learn not to blaspheme. So Paul has here left Timothy in Ephesus to deal with some problems. Left him with the job of dealing with the corruption that false teachers have brought into that church and to deal with not only the false doctrine that's being taught, but the people who are teaching it and believing it. In order to reinstate an environment in that church, that is non-hostile to the gospel, a place where discipleship can actually happen, where people can actually be nourished in the things of God. And in order for that to happen, young Timothy is going to have to knock some heads, so to speak. Paul has already started the process, we see in verse 20, and Timothy is expected to finish the job. Apparently, Paul, in his time at Ephesus excommunicated or kicked a couple of individuals out of the church. He gives their names here. And he calls Timothy to finish what Paul began. A very difficult job. There comes a day when you have to use everything that you've been learned in church to defend the faith you've got against attack, oftentimes in the church. We don't just come here for nothing. We're coming here to be trained, and sooner or later that training must be appropriated on the field of battle. And that field of battle is the church. Notice the terminology here. Wage good warfare, Timothy. Where? At church on Sunday. That's where the war happens. That's where Timothy is at right now. God oftentimes allows new converts or visitors to the church to enjoy a period of naivety where they innocently believe that everyone beside them in the church is safe and friendly. But the longer you attend any church, any legitimate church, the more you realize that that's not the case, and the more that you realize that that's not the case, the more responsibility you have to deal with them. I didn't say it, like the problem, like it's them, problem people. They need to be dealt with in order to defend the integrity of both Scripture and God's church, to keep it pure. It should be a place of purity. 
We have to understand that when God drafts us into Christianity, He doesn't draft us into comfort and security. He drafts you into spiritual war, danger, sometimes death. Real Christianity is described as warfare. He says it here. Wage the good warfare. Wage war in an honorable way, in a way that pleases God. If you look at biblical terminology throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, you see that war is a common theme. In 2 Timothy, Paul's next letter to this man, he says in chapter 2, Share in suffering with me as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Weapons are the terminology that the Apostle Paul uses to explain our lot as Christians in 2 Corinthians 6 and in chapter 10 as well, he talks about the weapons that we use in warfare. He talks about the armor that we wear as soldiers in Ephesians 6, Romans 13, 1 Thessalonians 5. We're regarded as soldiers in a fight, in a war, in 1 Corinthians 9, in Philemon as well. In Exodus 15, 3, the Lord, the Bible says, is a man of war himself. God is a man of war. And he drafts you and I to partake in the war that he is fighting. God's a man of war because his great enemy is Satan. And God drafts angels, and Satan drafts demons, and Satan and uh, angels and demons also have a conflict happening. And angels commission men and women just as much as demons commission men and women, and there is conflict then on the human level as well, but this is God's war into which we have been drafted. Let me ask you a couple questions here. Is war polite? Is war beautiful? Is war peaceful? War is the absence of peace, isn't it? And a lot of people go, no, no, Jesus is all about peace. Jesus is all about peace with God, but not peace with each other. There will not be peace with you and everybody else if you indeed are a legitimate Christian. Christians aren't at peace. There is no harmony in the relationship that a Christian has with somebody who opposes God. Because Bible says that God put enmity between his children and Satan's children. Those who believe in Jesus and those who don't believe in Jesus, there is enmity between them. Enmity is an English word that corresponds with the Hebrew word which means personal hostility. Hostility between persons. Hatred between persons. You say, well, that's not Christian. Yes, it is Christian. We're called to love those enemies, but there's still enemies, there's still hostility, there's still tension, there's still hatred. We're called to love them, yes. But to be friends with them, no. To have peace with them, no. To pretend that there isn't tension and hostility, ridiculous. When the resistors of God make their way into this church, don't expect harmony. There are people who frequent this fellowship on occasion that make my hairs bristle. I simply don't like them. And I'm not required to because if they don't like the God I serve, then I'm not required to like them. I'm required to love them, but the way that that love looks to some people isn't going to look much like love. You say, well, that's just really, really hardcore, really, really strong position to take. It's a biblical position. Paul here is telling Timothy to wage war in the parameter of his own fellowship, dealing with people who say they love Jesus but don't. Paul goes, I already got the ball rolling by kicking two of them out. We're called to defend our territory against anything and anyone who would attack the truth of the faith. And the truth is, the truth is being attacked on all fronts. And if we don't learn to deal with it with a little bit of assertiveness, if not aggression, then we lose the battle, don't we? True Christianity is a little bit more than just quiet Bible reading over a cup of coffee in the morning, guys. It includes submission, obedience, discipline, confrontation, intolerance, 
excommunication, the destruction of some relationships, all of those things which are apparent in war. Ask anybody who's in the military. Is submission required? Absolutely. Obedience? Yes. Discipleship? Come on. This can be especially difficult for some if you tend toward laziness, passivity, or cowardice. It can be hard for you. War is hard for people who can't stomach the sight of blood. But again, we've been drafted. We have some evidence in these letters to Timothy that Timothy might have been a man of timid character himself. Makes his job exceedingly difficult, doesn't it? Paul's going, get in there and knock heads. I won't be around so you won't have that support that I you know, bring. Um, you're on your own now. I left you behind to go and deal with problem people. And Timothy, if he's at all timid like we might think, this has got to be like his worst nightmare. I don't feel comfortable. I don't feel adequate. I don't feel like I have the authority. I don't have. And Paul's going, I just wrote you a letter that you can carry in your hand while you excommunicate people and go, Paul told me to. And God told him to tell me. Paul's left him with a very difficult task. But you know what, guys? It's all part of Timothy's growth as a Christian, isn't it? Hey, Timothy, you love Jesus? Rise to the challenge. You love his church? Clean it up. You love God's people? Protect them from others who don't. Grow, Christian. Grow, Timothy. Mature a little bit. Let's be good for you. In verse 18, Paul says, This charge I commit to you, son Timothy. This charge. Look at verse 3 for a second. Verse 3, Paul says, I urged you when I went into Macedonia. I urged you okay, that you stay behind and take care of things. When Paul left, he was urging Timothy. Now he's charging Timothy. This word charge is a military command, similar to the word commandment in verse 1 that we've discussed previously. It's a military command. This is a non-negotiable command. You'll also find it in chapter 5, verse 21, and in chapter 6, verse 12. It's a non-negotiable, direct order from a superior. This is wartime. You're a soldier. I'm your commander. Deal with the issues. Don't avoid them. That's not an option. Confront it head on. Timothy probably wasn't very eager to do this. I mean, you know, if I'm him, there's nothing in me that's going, yay, I get to kick people out of church and deal with problems. This is going to be fun. Nobody wants to do that. And if you do want to do that, you've got to really check yourself and see whether or not you've got the mercy to be a leader as well. You know, you can't just pull the gun and kill everybody. But I don't think Timothy's eager to do this by any means. When Paul says, this charge I commit to you. That word commit there, it's similar to the word that he's used elsewhere. It's translated entrust. I'm entrusting this to you. It's actually a banking term that means deposit, something of great value. It's the same language he used in verse 11 of this chapter. Same language as chapter 6, verse 20, if you want to look up these verses. Same language as 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 14, and chapter 2, verse 2. What Paul is saying is, take the precious truth of the gospel that I've spent the last 30 years of my life guarding, you take care of it, and then pass it along in its original condition to somebody else who's going to do the same thing. Guard it. I'm entrusting this to you. I'm making a deposit in you. I believe that you are capable of doing what you need to do to make sure that this work carries on. It's going to take some backbone on Timothy's behalf. A lot of backbone. Paul says to him, this charge I commit to you, Timothy, look at what he says next, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you. Well, what's prophecy? We know what prophecy is, don't we? That's that Old Testament kind of approach to God's speaking through somebody to a person or to a group. 
God directly addressing somebody so that they understand clearly what God intends. And apparently, God had used prophecy earlier in Timothy's life. He, he was prophesied over. God spoke through somebody who knew Timothy so that it became undeniably clear to Timothy that God would eventually put him in this position. In other words, God was preparing Timothy for this a long time ago. God was clear with him so that when Timothy faced these eventual hardships and the discouragements and the doubts that come along with any legitimate ministry, he would remember how sure he was of this back when he had a clear head so that he could keep marching forward even in times of uncertainty. That's why God gave Joseph dreams, if you know the Old Testament. That's why God gave Paul visions so that when difficulty came, they could latch on to what they knew was clear in the past and know that what they're doing in the present is God's will. God told me to do this. I was clear on it a few years ago when he called me into it. And so even if I'm doubting right now, I know I'm where I'm supposed to be. Because listen to me, there are going to come times in your Christianity where you seriously doubt if you're where you're supposed to be. Even when you're faithful to God. Now, there's going to be some times where you're in sin and you're not where you're supposed to be. You need to repent and get back on track. However, even those who remain faithful to God are sometimes going to be caught in the whirlwind of doubt and they're going to start wondering if they're even serving God. If, is this what I'm supposed to do? This happens to me, by the way. If you don't think that I don't face times of uncertainty, difficulty, I mean, things are just falling apart at the church or there's problem people, I've got to deal with stuff and I go, God, am I doing anything right? Am I even supposed to be a pastor? And he goes, remember the confidence I gave you when I called you? Do you remember that time in your life when you were absolutely certain? Latch on to that. Because there have been times in my life where God made it exceedingly clear that I was to do this. I remember... When I first came to church, I think it was the first day I ever stepped in my foot into the uh, Menominee Church, it was overwhelmingly clear that I, this was my home and that I would never leave these people. God was clear with me on that. And then the school of ministry was presented to me as an opportunity. And I'll tell you, God communicated to me. I won't say spoke, give you the idea that he spoke to me verbally. No, he communicated to me very clearly that school of ministry was what was needed. So I pursued that. Then there came the point in my life where it was time to be sent out to start a church and we were looking at, you know, the Twin Ports and I'll tell you that God was very clear with me when it came time to move and make the jump. Why? Because when God does that to you, when he's clear with you up front, it's because he in his foresight sees that down the road from that point there's going to come a lot of doubt in your mind and you're going to be wondering if, if you were even supposed to do this in the first place and then he's going to give you something to latch on to so that you can have the confidence you need to keep going in faith when you have times of severe doubt listen that's why I think it would be really good for some of you who aren't married yet to be very careful who you marry and make sure that you have a very, 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 very clear green light from God before you tie the knot so that in those times in your marriage when you're starting to think, well, I even supposed to marry this person? They're an idiot. You know the answer to that and you don't fall back according to your own doubts or apprehensions. Same thing with having kids. You better be absolutely clear that it's God's will. Well, I just want to have a bunch of kids. So what? What does God want? I want to take this job. It's the best job I've ever been offered. They offer, you know, $8 billion a week. So what? Is this what God wants? I mean, there are some big decisions in life that we can't afford to be flippant about yet. Many are. And their life is shipwrecked. Why? Because they strayed from the faith. Why? Because what the world offered seemed so much better than what God was offering. And so we take the bait. We lose the war. God was very clear with Timothy about this before Timothy even got into the ministry. God was working through other people in the fellowship to pray over him and prophesy over him so that he had a confidence in his calling and could walk forward in that. In 
verse 19, the Apostle Paul says, these prophecies will help you wage good warfare. And then he says, having faith and a good conscience. Timothy, I want you to remember the prophecies that were made about you. Not only that, but I'm charging you to do this. And so Timothy has the certainty of knowing that God has called him to this and that Paul was commanding him to do this so that he could carry on in his commission with faith and a clean conscience. Faith and a clean conscience even though what he's about to do in that church is going to feel so wrong. Timothy's about to knock heads, right? He's about to confront people. And it's going to feel very wrong for him. If he's going to be faithful to God and loyal to Paul, he's going to have to hurt some people's feelings. He's going to have to make judgments on people's actions and character. He's going to have to kick some people out of church. He's going to publicly embarrass others. And in some cases, he's going to destroy their lives, turning them over to Satan for the destruction. And that's going to feel very wrong to him. It's likely going to bother his conscience because all of these things seem to be the opposite of what a Christian, let alone a minister, should be doing. Aren't we supposed to build each other up and speak love into each other's lives and really encourage one another? And, and then Paul goes, no, kick them out of church, embarrass them, publicly humiliate them, deal with them, confront them. And I know this is probably going to bother your conscience a little bit, Timothy, so remember that prophecies were made over you and I'm commanding you to do this. So this is really on God and me, not you. You just follow orders. I'm directly ordering you as a soldier to do this. He's going to struggle with guilt. Timothy is. Listen, I struggle with guilt. When I have to be hard with somebody and then they leave the church and then they post on Facebook how much they hate us or something like that, it makes me go, well, did I do it right? And thank God that I have both scripture and a pastor who's been through this much further than I have backing me and going, oh no, you, you did it perfectly. That's ministry encouraging me and reminding me that, yeah, this is war and this is what happens. Can send a guy crazy. I mean, think about Abraham. God commanded him to kill his kid. Doesn't make sense. And yet, in faith and a good conscience, listen, how can you kill your kid with good conscience? And yet, in obedience to God, he marched up the hill, and he had his son. He tied him down to the altar, and he was ready to slice his throat, and then God stopped him. I mean, how confusing would that have been in Abraham's mind to kill his own kid and think that God was telling him to do it if God had not been so clear with him that it was his will? There's a lot of blood in church. We just can't see it because it's shed on the spiritual plane. Timothy's going to struggle with guilt over this. He's likely to be attacked for this by people in the church. I, I, I could just nearly guarantee you that he's going to be accused of being loveless and ungodly. All for being faithful to Jesus, the good shepherd, rather than acquiescing to the whims of the sheep. See, Timothy, you don't do ministry according to how sheep want it done. You do it according to how the good shepherd commands. Paul goes on to say that some have rejected the faith. Some. There's a handful of them. This isn't limited to just one or two. There's a group of people in that church who have rejected the faith. It's interesting to me that they've rejected the faith, but apparently they haven't left the church. That's insane, isn't it? Why would you come to church if you don't want to be faithful to Jesus? Reject the faith, but they're still there. He gives two names, Hymenaeus and Alexander. He says, well, they would have stayed in the church, but I kicked them out. And I, I believe that the reason that their names are given is because of, in the entire group of those who were apostate, those who rejected the faith, these two men specifically were most notable. 
probably because their sphere of influence was greater than anybody else. That makes them more dangerous than any of the some who have rejected the faith. They're dangerous people. And so clear warning is needed, and the naming of names is warranted in order to protect God's faithful who are still there. In other words, be careful of Hymenaeus and Alexander. We've had plenty of people come through this church and suffer the same sort of shipwreck that Paul describes here, but none of them have any real sphere of influence, so they're hardly worth mentioning. Most shipwrecks never make headlines. Did you know that? Do you know how many boats have sunk that you know, know about? But every once in a while, you'll have a Titanic. You'll have a SS Edmund Fitzgerald. You'll have an Exxon Valdez, if you remember that. We know those names, don't we? But you don't know of the fishing boat that sank off of the coast of Central America uh, last Tuesday, which I don't even know if there was one, but you get my point. Lots of boats sink, but few are noteworthy. These two men were noteworthy because the level of publicity is always proportionate to the extent of the devastation how it works on the ocean that's how it works in the church but there's a lot of them there's there's a group of these folks two have been named but I'll tell you anyone in that group of faith rejectors even the nobodies that we aren't given their names they're still in the same category as these two whose names we do have they're in the same category they have rejected the faith on an equal level they're just as shipwrecked there's a lot of people out there in the church this one and others who set sail on the course of discipleship and they do really good at first they stay afloat for a while but then over the course of time I guess they fall asleep at the wheel something happens they mistakenly think that training and godliness is all smooth sailing unless they go to this church because I constantly remind you that it's not they didn't expect rocks to be there in the water. They didn't expect icebergs to be getting in their way. And the major issue with these folks is that they aren't always alarmed when they see them on the radar. They don't think, well, I'm not going to hit these rocks. And so what they end up doing is they keep their course. They keep living the same life they're living, even though there's dangers, even though people around them serve as radars going, be careful, iceberg, iceberg. They don't take the warnings, they don't see the rocks, and they slam headlong into them, thinking that they're impervious to sinking. I can do this and it won't touch me. You're fooling no one. They were undisciplined and lazy when it came to obedience to Christ. They thought that Christianity was easy, so they ne never made any effort to disciple themselves. And Paul warns Timothy of this. In, in, in chapter 4, he says, keep a close watch on how you live Timothy because if Hymenaeus and Alexander two leaders in the church if they can if they can sink Timothy you can sink so I the message that I preach to you this morning is is being it's preached to myself first because no one in this room is beyond shipwreck that includes your pastor could I go down in a ball of flames absolutely all I have to do is get flippant, let down my guard, stop disciplining myself, get lazy, careless. And what exactly was their error? What was the error? What caused the shipwreck? Why did Hymenaeus and Alexander's life end with destruction? excommunication booted from the church you don't get to come here anymore what how did it get that what happened that that was the result well in verse 20 he gives their names and then he says I've delivered them to Satan so that they may learn not to blaspheme apparently their problem was blasphemy these were highly influential men in the church they were recognized on some level as leaders and their lives 
were emitting blasphemy. What do we mean when we say blasphemy? I would suggest to you that we're not talking about a verbal, God-bashing type of language. I don't think that's that at all. These guys would never have gained any followers among God's people by trash-talking God and cursing out Jesus. That's, that's not what they're doing. This is a blasphemy of another kind. This is blasphemy against God that doesn't just emanate from their own lives, but begins to emanate from the lives of the people that follow them by anybody who hypocritically speaks praise to God, but lives in rebellion to him. Which is exactly what these men were doing, and they were beginning to influence the lives of others. I want you to turn for a moment to Romans chapter 2, so that we can understand a little bit clearly what we're talking about when we refer to this kind of blasphemy. Romans chapter 2, <clears throat> and starting in verse 17, says, Indeed, you are called a Jew, and you rest on the law and make your boast in God. If you stop there, hold on a second. We could replace the word Jew with Christian. Okay? And we could replace the word law with Bible. Okay? So let's read it again. Indeed, you're called a Christian, and you rest on the Bible, and you make your boast in God, and you know his will, and you approve the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the Bible. And you're confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, like you're a good example to people around you. They should be more like you. And you're a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish because you're so wise and you have it so together. You're a teacher of babes. You have the form of knowledge and truth in the Bible. You, therefore, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man shouldn't steal, are you stealing? You who say, don't commit adultery, sexual immorality, are you into sexual immorality? You who abhor, abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the Bible, do you dishonor God by not living the Bible? Verse 24 says, For the name of God is blasphemed among unbelievers because of you. So we have to understand what these men were doing in the church was this style of blasphemy where their life, their conduct didn't match their supposed beliefs and that then was being saturated into the rest of the fellowship so that they were living hypocritical lives too. We all come to church, we all sing praise to God, but we're living in sin and nobody cares and God's great and wonderful and no, no, that's not true at all. You don't love God. When you're living in sin, you're saying, I hate you. That's a slap in the face to God. That's rebellion. It's also a slap in the face to anyone who does love God. When you sin against Jesus, you're sinning against us. Paul says blasphemy was their error. They said they loved Jesus, but boy, you'd never know it. Some people's entire Christian lives reek of this kind of blasphemy. The way that they live is so out of sync with scriptural practice that even though they're part of a church, they're actually hindering others from coming to Christ for salvation because of the way that they live. God is blasphemed among unbelievers because of you. The best preaching doesn't stop them. They hear what the Bible says. They're educated in scripture, but it does nothing in them. They've been repeatedly warned of their sins, but they won't repent. They hear good biblical doctrine week after week after week, but they still haven't learned anything. And listen to me. In those cases, according to verse 20, Satan becomes a more suitable teacher for them than their own pastor. And so the pastor then has the responsibility of removing them from the classroom of the church and enrolling them, whether they like it or not, in a program where they can learn from the devil himself without our constant interference. If you won't listen to God, then maybe you'll listen to the devil. Some lessons just can't be learned in church. Or maybe I should say, some people insist on learning their lessons elsewhere. Let it be known that the way that you live your life illustrates God to the world. The way that you live your life illustrates God to the world. Who cares that you go to church? If the life you live paints a picture of God that's not true, then your behavior is teaching something about God that's not true. 
We're no different then than the men mentioned in our text this morning or the other folks who have suffered shipwreck in that church because they have wrecked, rejected the faith. The big question, I guess, this morning is why would anybody stay in a church after they've rejected the faith? To make Timothy's life miserable? I don't know. I guess that'd be a really good way to do it. Like, if you hate Timothy, just stay at church. Sin to your heart's content and stay at church. That'll get Timothy. Because it does. I bet you this guy loses sleep at night. He's not looking forward to church on Sunday. He knows he's going to have to deal with people. It's just not fun. So maybe you hate Timothy and you want to stay at church. But why, why beyond that would a person stay in the church when they don't want to serve, love God's people and Jesus Christ? Well, maybe they attend church because it's safe. It just feels safe here. And it does. And it should. And this is a safe place. But not always. War zones aren't always safe. They're safe insofar as there are trained warriors here who all have guns, if you know what I mean. We know how to use the weapons of warfare and we will seek to protest, protect you. But it's not safe enough that you'll never get shot at. That's the nature of the game. Maybe they come to church because the world has so wore them out that they come here to recuperate before they go back out for another round of sin. <laughs> you know? It's like, it's like a boxing match where when the bell dings and you're in between rounds, you get to run back to your corner and sit down for a while and put the Vaseline above the eye and you get a little squirt of water. Some people treat church like that. I'm going to go out and sin and sin and sin and just get beat up and Satan is going to wreck me and I'm just going to sin and sin and sin and hate God and hate God's people and talk trash about everybody and I'm going to do whatever I want and I'm going to come back to church and I'm going to sit in the corner and be like, <gasps> A little water. Oh, help me out. Okay, ding, ding, back to fight and back to sin. Maybe they like being around other people that God's blessing because it's the only way that they can convince themselves that he's blessing them too. Maybe they come here to get rid of their guilt. I don't know what they come here for. They think God's approval is based on the church they attend rather than the life that they live. God could give a rip that you come to JFB Duluth. Did you know that? God could give a rip whether you're Baptist or Lutheran or Catholic or what. You know what he cares about? Whether or not you listen to the Bible. He cares about the life you're living. Well, Timothy is holding the same letter in his hand that you and I have open before us this morning. And this man gets the fun job of cleaning a house. Cleaning a house in a church that apparently had problems. Apparently had people in it that weren't taking their faith seriously or had altogether written God off and just continued to come to church regardless. I don't get it, but they were. We're at war. We're at war, guys. Church is a war zone. Jesus said our enemies will be those of our own household. And I've seen this work itself out over the past, I don't know, six years that we've been up here. I've seen some people come in here and, and they love Jesus and they do all this. And yet when the costume comes off, they abandon us, leaving us with a big hole to, to fill. In a church this small, when one person leaves, we feel an emptiness. So now we got to scratch. They don't care, but they're just gone. And then while they're out there, they send arrows back into the fellowship with hard words, condemning whoever's left, treating you as if you're Satan incarnate, doing everything they can to destroy what we thought they were here to help build. It's amazing to me. Our enemies will be those of our own household. We're given no choice here but to confront flesh and blood with the truth. Flesh and blood means people. We need to stand our ground and hold tight to the truth that we've been entrusted with. You say, no, that's Timothy's job, not mine. That's, that's like the pastor's job. Listen, again, this has a trickle-down effect. God versus Satan. Angels versus demons. Unbelievers versus believers. Love your enemies. But confront error. It's the loving thing to do. You say, yeah, but we're not supposed to wrestle, wrestle against flesh and blood, like the Bible says. 
our warfare is against spiritual things like Satan and demons. No, your warfare is against flesh and blood insofar as satanic influence has commissioned them for you to deal with. That's where the warfare happens. Okay? Nobody in here is doing battle with Satan. But you're going to go out there and you're going to do battle with people who hate God. That's where the battle ends up being. And oftentimes the struggle comes right into the church. The warfare may happen on the spiritual level, but it always manifests itself in the physical realm. We're dealing with problem people. And do you know who the first one that you need to confront is? It's yourself. It's yourself. I mean, none of us in here should be at war with anyone else until we've gone to war with our own sin. We'd be hypocrites. Wouldn't we? Wouldn't, wouldn't, we, wouldn't we be in the same danger as Hymenaeus and Alexander who were living a life of blasphemous conduct saying, you know, you ought to do this and you ought to do that and you're sinning in your life and yet they wouldn't take care of it themselves? And do you know that that is a path that will end in shipwreck? You approve of everybody else who lives a godly life. You tell everybody else what's sin and what isn't and but you are letting yourself go completely adrift. There's an iceberg straight ahead. Guys, I know that this is a bit of a heavy message, or at least that's my guess. I don't know if I'm putting you to sleep or if you're alarmed by this. It doesn't, it's not my job to do either. God will do in you what he intends to do, but um, these three verses introduce us to an idea um, that this church is not unfamiliar with. We're at war. God has called us to something more than just, you know, attending church and raising our hands in worship and then going home and pretending like nothing ever happened. We're at war, and just so you know, war never takes a break. This is 24-7. It's not a Sunday-only thing. We are at war. As soon as we let our guard down, you will see that sin in you will creep up once again. It's a constant, wearying battle. Church wears you out. Right? You know this, right? Any of you have been around for a while? Church is going to wear you out. People are going to wear you out. You're going to wear you out. And yet we keep on because the Holy Spirit energizes us and He is a man of war. Commissioning you and I to engage in warfare. This doesn't mean that we all have to sit down with each other after this and totally confront each other, start kicking people out of church. We're not, you know, that isn't needed. Not at this point. Not at this point. But if you want to become a public social experiment, indulge in sin. Refuse to repent of it. Live for yourself instead of others and keep on with it. Somebody's going to talk to you. Something has to happen. God means business. I mean, I don't know if it's First Timothy or what, but I read this and I'm like, holy smokes, God is not, he's not messing around. And, and frankly, neither was the Apostle Paul, was he? Hey, Timothy, hang back in Ephesus and kick a few more people out of church. They're living lives that don't match the gospel. They're blaspheming. That's not good. Kick them out. They've rejected the faith. They don't, they don't obey God. So what that they come to church? I don't care if they sing praying songs to God. I don't care if they have a service position. I don't care if they're in leadership. I already kicked two guys out who were up there. Do you with it, Timothy? Listen, let me say this. How about after a message like this, we just commit to loving one another in a way that doesn't tolerate error, doesn't tolerate sin, so that when we see that in each other and it's kind of going on, it's, it's concerning us, we actually address our concerns to one another. I think, I think that would be a good place to start. None of us needs to carry an ax and chop people down. You just need to, when you see something amiss in somebody's life, just mention it. Say, hey, I noticed you weren't here when we were all together. What's up? Hey, I noticed that um, you've been doing this or that. I, I noticed that, uh, you know, um, somebody was saying this. Is that true about you? Did you actually... I'm afraid that we are so worried 
about insulting one another that in the process we insult the spirit of grace. God's all about purity in the church. He really is. You're like, no, he said that the wheat should grow with the tares. Don't pull them up or you'll pull the wheat out. No, that's in the world. In the church, we're supposed to practice church discipline. It's okay. Okay. I would encourage you guys to, as Paul encouraged Timothy, wage good warfare. Practice discernment. Know when to fire the gun and know when to put the gun down. It's a balancing act. And, and after a message like this, you might think, well, we've got to just you know, use a gun a lot. You know, we've got to take people out, you know, deal with them harshly. That's not at all what I'm saying. I'm introducing you to the fact that that should happen sometimes but not always. You deal with one another in love, and if you love each other, you won't allow somebody to walk in front of a moving train. And all sin is a moving train. There will be shipwreck. Let's pray. Father, we uh, come to you this morning and we say, help us. Help us to have that discernment that knows when somebody should be confronted when somebody should be given grace. Um, it's really a balancing act. I'm sure that Timothy's mind was just spinning after these instructions. What do I do now? Who do I deal with first? Who has problems and who is just kind of immature and doesn't know what they're doing? I pray that you would help us to have such a passion for what happens in God's household here in the church that we would take a strong stand for purity and righteousness in here, not among us, among these members. I mean, like, Jesus like went to church and started ripping the place up. Zeal for your house has eaten me up, he says. And it's like, man, and I mean, if we care about church at all, we ought to protect it from anything that would rape it of its impurity. To guard it against sin in our own lives first and then in those around us who we claim to love. I pray that we get that that's okay. That we're not timid about it. I pray that like Timothy, we're not eager to do it. That would be weird. But that when confronted with sin, we obediently do do it. Well, God, I entrust that you are able and willing to continue teaching us once this is over, that you would help us navigate relationships in a way that pleases you, remembering that you deliberately put personal hostility between us and those who reject the faith. It's okay to not like somebody who doesn't like God. I pray, however, that in love, we would help them realize that they're not loving the God who's given them life and kept their ship from sinking thus far. Well, we pray for your blessing, God, that you would bring us back together safe and sound next week. We love you and we praise your name. Amen.
almost done. Just hang in there a couple more minutes. Here's the most important thing about this service. The point of this service and every service we do here is simple. It's never meant to be an end, but a beginning. There's a feeling of conclusion you have right now in your heart. We know it. It's not bad. It's not evil. It just needs to be divinely transformed into a belief that says, when this service ends, my Christian faith begins. You see, the point is not to only receive all that this church has to offer. The point is to receive it, then give it away during the week. The point is not to make our church more exclusive, but to make Jesus available to everyone we brush up against. The point is not to pit the sacred against the secular, the Sunday against the Monday. The point is to see all of life, our church lives, our business lives, and our family lives as divine opportunities. The point is not for you to get caught up in your own story. The point is to become fully alive to the grand story that God is telling through you. Here's the point. Church is not about church. It's about living outside these walls. By the way we interact with people, we can and we will become the aroma of Jesus. And people won't just hear it, they'll feel it. They'll feel that their lives are not hopeless because you stink of hope. They'll feel the companionship of the Almighty because you are walking with them and they'll feel some for the first time in their lives the sweet aroma of being loved. So go, be loved by God. And give that love away freely to all. Because there are people in your current circle of relationships who are gasping for one breath of Christ's life. And you're it. That's the point.